I want you to open your Bibles tonight to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to try to finish this series tonight on faith. If you weren't here this weekend, I preached on angels, and it was pretty heavy. Uh, and I think there's a little more that i got to get into next, next weekend, but God has given His angels charge over us, and they're going to keep us. <laughs> and we, we are to live a supernatural life. Lift your hands for a moment and say a supernatural life. Uh, now I want you to kind of do something a little bit, a little faith movement here. Sometimes we do things in the natural that connect us to the spirit realm. Just reach your hands up and just say, uh, just grab a hold of it right now. Just a supernatural life. You say, that might be a little weird. That's all right. That's all right. Say it again, supernatural life. One of the things we know that faith is what connects us to a supernatural life. And there are enemies of faith. And people say that often they say that that fear is the opposite of faith. Well, that's because they both start with F in the English language. But it's not really the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith really isn't fear. The opposite of faith is doubt. When Jesus had Peter and told Peter to come out of the boat and Peter walked on the water and Peter began to sink, and he cried out in fear, the Bible says, and Jesus reached out, picked him up, and said, Oh, ye of little faith. He didn't say, Why did you get afraid? He said, Why did you ever say doubt? The word doubt literally means to think another thought. I'm going to smack a devil here tonight for the next few minutes, and we'll get here into the word. But somebody say, By faith. By faith. Say it again, say, By faith. In fact, let me begin with verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11, and then I'm going to hit this thing. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samson and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy of whom the world was not worthy. Someone said the world was not worthy. worthy. Say it again. Say the world was not worthy. The world was not worthy. They lived a radical life of faith, and the Bible says the world was not worthy of them. And I want to put something in your spirit tonight, that you, being a born-again child of God, the world is not worthy of you. Somebody say, I, I, I gotta, I'm going to have to smack this one for a while. The world is not worthy of you. <laughs> I'm going to say it maybe this side. Maybe they'll like it on this side. The world is not worthy of you. You see, the word doubt, means to think another thought, to consider another thought, to consider something other than what God had said. And God has said some pretty powerful, potent stuff about you. God said, you're a pearl purchased with a great price. He said, you're so valuable that... 
He gave an analogy that he would go and sell everything he had, which he did. He gave up his only begotten son, his only son. He gave up his only begotten son. He would sell everything he had in order to purchase you because that sets the standard of value. So you see, value is not established by just what people say. Value is established by what somebody is willing to pay for something. Amen. Come on, amen. If you are willing to pay $10 million for this microphone, this microphone is now worth $10 million. And if you are only willing to pay a penny for it, then this microphone is only worth a penny. Come on, somebody say amen. Your value is set by God and not set by you. I'm going to say that again. Your value is not set by you. Your value has been set by God. And God says, the children of faith, the world isn't even worthy of them. Now, how many people know? There's so, uh, somebody say the devil's a liar. Many, many Christians wrestle with a lie from the enemy of the sense of a lack of value. They don't believe they are worth much. They don't believe they have much value. They don't believe they are worthy. And God says, you are not allowed to set your wet worth. Come on, come on, y'all hearing me? Only the one who purchases you is the, all, is the one that can set your worth. Amen. 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 All right, we, we had some neighbors in California, and they were a little freaky. You know, I mean, there they were some Pakistanis, and, and they were just, I mean, they were just, they, they tore up their front yard and made it all rocks and all kinds of stuff, and everybody had these beautiful front yards. And, and, and then when the housing boom started kicking in, they started trying to sell their house, and they set the value of their house at about $150,000 more than what everybody else was selling it for. I mean, the neighboring house, exact same model, because it was track homes, the exact same model, everything was, was, was right there, and... Um, they, they, they were trying to sell it for more. Then the housing bubble went up. They kept raising the price, raising the price. Never sold the house. Then when the housing bubble in California crashed and the home was selling, went, the homes went from selling 700000 down to selling about 400000 they're still trying to get 700000 And they couldn't sell it. Why? Because the one, they couldn't set their own value. The one who would purchase it sets the value. Are y'all hearing me? It's really important. I can claim this is worth $10 million. But if nobody spends $10 million to get it, it is not worth it. The owner does not get to set the value. The purchaser does. And we have been trying to set our own value in our own minds, how we value ourselves, our worth based upon our perception of ourselves, based upon our perception of our righteousness, based upon our perception of our talent, based upon our perception of, 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 of how the world and all these different things, and we set a value on ourselves. And the devil is a liar. You don't have the right to set your own value. Only he who purchased you. And God came down and set a price on your head so high that there is no one else in the history of the universe that could outbid him. And God says, the world is not worthy of the children of faith. Come on, now I want you to say it. I want it to rise up. Say, the world is not worthy of me. Now, I know some people say, oh, I might get arrogant and full of pride and everything. No, let me tell you something. When you get this revelation, you'll be so humbled every day of your life, realizing that God took you who was on your way to hell and it was a nothing. And God, not because of you, but simply because he loves you, set a value on you so high. <laughs> by faith. They live their life by faith. 
loyalty to authority, the most base root of this faith is the faith that you accept the value God set on your life. And doubt is the opposite of faith. Doubt is to think another thought. Come on, y'all hearing me? You see, you can't... I, 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 let's go to chapter 12 here just for a second. Let's go to chapter 12 here just for a second. Verse 1. I got to show you this. Oh, Therefore, someone say therefore. Everything we've been reading, everything we've been studying. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and let us run with endurance the race which is set before us. Watch this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us get rid of all the junk. Let us walk away. He says in chapter 10, let us therefore now come boldly unto the throne of grace. How can you come boldly unto the throne of grace when you don't view yourself as having value to go there? Come on, y'all hearing me? The devil keeps warring with your value. He keeps warring with your worth. To try to keep you from boldly going to the throne. Because as long as you don't, you feel you don't deserve. And you may say, Pastor Steve, you don't understand what I've done. No, you don't understand what he has done. We don't justify sin around here. We're not going to sweep it under the rug. We're not going to pretend it's not there. But let me tell you something. Heaven is more focused on you being a child of faith. And if you fall, get up. And you fall, get up. And just keep getting up. Be that child of faith. Keep walking. Keep moving. Keep charging forward. Huh? But the devil wants to change your perception of you. He wants to keep beating you down. He wants to say you're not worthy enough. There's people that come into this church and they see the power of God fall and the anointing of God. They hear me talk about angels. And then the devil starts lying to him and says, well, you're not spiritual enough to get that. You're not, you're not, this is too deep of a church for you. This is too, you're, you're not, you're not there. You're not worthy of this. You're not good enough. You don't pray enough. Oh, don't you understand? When you start getting those encounters, you won't have a trouble with praying anymore when you start having those experiences you'll have the strength you're not worthy that's a lie that's doubt the truth is God set a value on you someone say he loves me let's go back man just tore my bible (laughs) I did. It just went rip. Hebrews chapter. That's why I keep going through them. Hebrews chapter eleven. Begin with verse thirty-two again. Someone say, "There's value on my life." Say it again. The world's not worthy of me. Hmm. Oh, may we get this? You know how you're going to walk around, not haughty and arrogant. But absolutely confident. Amen. Benjamin was telling me, he called me up. It was, you told me the, the scientific study. Wasn't it you that told me about the study? He called me up about the study. They've proven scientifically that it, when you're like depressed or discouraged or, 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 or very negative, that your body actually radiates, um, vibrates at a certain, t- uh, like a musical instrument. And other people around you pick up on that. And, though, and it actually, they've proven it, it actually attracts other people who are that way. Yeah. Negative people attract negative people. Yeah. Well, I don't understand why I'm always having a hard time. It's always so bad. <laughs> Everything goes wrong. That's because you're attracting it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Amen. But it also opposite when you got people that are full of joy and confidence that it actually radiates and it draws. In fact, they prove guys, young guys, they prove that when you walk confident, the ladies are attracted. (laughs) 
Keep it sanctified. Keep it sanctified. <laughs> but it's, no. So, but that confidence, but when you have that confidence, when you have the revelation of your worth and value before God, you can walk confidently. Amen. I got value. I'm assigned value by God. Shoo. Oh, watch this. Watch this. Okay, verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail, fall me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. Hmm. Gideon, hiding in a little threshing floor from the weakest of the tribes of Israel. He was, he was from, he was, he was from the poor part of the Metroplex. He was from, he was from the, the, un, the uneducated, and the, the, non, the, not, the part that's not strong. He was from the weak crowd. Anybody, don't raise your hand. Anybody here ever feel weak? You feel weak? He said, God, 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 God often chooses the weak ones. And he says, I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose the one that everybody looks at and says, there ain't no one. Have you seen them? Have you, have, you, have, have you looked at them? Do you realize how messed up they are? And God says, there's a candidate. I'm going to put a worth on them and a value on them. So what did, what did God do first to this guy who was hiding, timid, sneaking in at night to work at the threshing floor because he's so intimidated by the enemies and he's from the weakest tribe of the weakest clan of the weakest tribe of the weakest family of the weakest everything. He was, he was a weakling. What did God do? God sent an angel to him. Ooh, there's an angel again, by the way. God sent an angel. I like these angels. God sent an angel to him. And he said, oh, mighty man of valor. Wow. And Gideon was says, where? <laughs> Why did God speak that over him? Because he needed to begin to get the revelation of the worth and value that God was setting on him. In order to have the confidence to face what God was about to take him through. Come on, y'all hearing me? He'll speak over you. God felt it important. Oh, mighty man of valor. Y'all hearing me? Shakata. Did he feel mighty? No. Did he look mighty? No. And was he engaging in mighty acts? No. He was hiding. Don't you understand? The army, the enemies were coming in and they were raiding the fields. And and, and so he had to sneak out in the middle of the night to try to get just get a little food for his family. He was hiding out. He was a coward. He was afraid. And God said, I'm going to begin to speak life into you. I'm going to speak confidence into you. I'm going to put a value on you. Mighty man of valor. Someone said the devil's a liar. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, Hello, mighty man or mighty woman. No, well, no, get it right. You could hear a lot. My goodness. Some of you, gosh. They subdued. Someone say subdued kingdoms. They took over. Oh, I'm going to get excited here. Come on. They subdued kingdoms. They subdued kingdoms. This weekly, nobody good for nothing failure of a life hiding and, and sneaking around in the dark suddenly was able to subdue a kingdom. Please get it in your spirit by faith. What gave him the ability to be loyal to God through that? He had begun to get the value or the revelation of the value that God set on him. Oh, mighty man of valor. Why do you think God said in in uh, Deuteronomy 28, you are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Uh, You'll be blessed coming in and blessed going out. Your enemies will come at you one way, but they'll flee from you at seven. Why do you think God spoke these things over you? Because he's trying to build in you the value that he has set on you because that'll give you the ability to live this life of faith. Huh? 
Come Say, I am a miracle working servant of God. You are. You're a miracle working servant of God. When you get the value of the revelation that He is, that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and that your prayers have power and priority. Why? Because you are a child of the Most High God. You are a joint heir with Christ Jesus, which means you have the same legal right to de- request from the Father what Jesus does. No, you didn't get that. You didn't get that. You didn't get that. You, as a child of God, born again, washed in the blood, have the same legal right to stand before God to ask, which literally means to make a demand of something due. You have the same legal right to make a demand of the Father in Jesus' name that Jesus himself does. That's why Jesus said, if you ask, make a demand of anything of my Father in my name, it shall. Not maybe. Not questioning. You don't have to wait for a response for six months like the federal government. (laughs) It shall. Someone say shall. Say it again. Say shall. Another revelation or word, uh, understanding of, we talk about faith being loyalty to God, fidelity to God. Another meaning of the word faith is confidence. Are you saying, see, the devil does everything to rob you of your confidence. Let us therefore now come boldly with confidence. Because it never was about my performance. It was never about my giftings and my talents. It was always about the value he set. Please, please, please think with me for a moment on this. Why would God, who knows that you and I are but frail human beings, and in ourselves we are weak. Hello. Listen, can I solve a problem for you right now? You ain't no match for the devil by yourself. (laughs) He's been deceiving man for thousands of years. He's, a, he's smarter than you. He's trickier than you. You ain't no match for... Hello? In yourself, you ain't no match for the devil. Amen. That's why the Bible says, greater is he that is in you. He didn't say greater is you. Amen. Come on, amen? amen? Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You're no match for the devil. You're no match for him. You're you're no match in and of yourself. You are weak. You are frail. You are you are you are vulnerable at every single moment. The only thing that keeps us is the grace and the power of God. So hear me, hear me. Why would God, because of our failures and our frailties and our weaknesses, cut us off? From access to him when only access to him is what can get us to be free. I need you to go be my purchaser for my business. And I need you to go buy me these products. And I need you to buy me these products so I can have them, so I can sell them and make a profit and have a business. You're my guy, and you mess up. So I say, well, now you no longer have access to the money, but do the job. I don't give you access to the money to buy the product, but I still require you to buy the product to do the job. 
Come on, amen? No. I correct the error, but I still got to give him access to the power so he can do what I called him to do. That's why the Bible says if any of us sins, let us, you know, if, if you sin, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Why? I got to remove out all the barriers so you can come back, tap back into the power and walk righteous. Oh, Brother Steve, I'm just no worthy. I'm just, a, I'm just so terrible. I'm just a good for nothing, horrible, evil, wicked person. Well, if you go to some churches, they'll make you feel that way. Come on. Come on. I'm just, oh, oh. And then they think that's humble. No, that keeps them from the confidence to boldly come to the throne of grace. And be able to say, all right, you know what? I fell. I slipped up. I got deceived. I, 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 I opened the door, whatever. But I'm going to shake that thing off. I'm, forget I'm, I'm, I'm running over here. I'm tapping into more power. I'm going to tap. And I have the right to say, Father, strengthen me right now. Yeah. 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 When you, the confidence. Let us therefore now come back. Boldly. Ever say boldly. boldly. Say it again. Say boldly. boldly. Shoo. Huh. Huh. Through faith they subdue kingdoms. Watch this. Through faith, through that confidence, through the confidence they worked righteousness. The confidence which gave them the ability to boldly come and engage in that relationship with God is why they could work righteousness. They didn't work righteousness to get to Him. By faith, they came to Him so they could work righteousness. I'm talking to a young, uh, young guy in the gym. He didn't want to come here because he said, well, i got to get some things fixed in my life. How dumb can you be and still breathe? That's not, no, 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 no. God has calling you. God has set a value on you. And you just sit there and say, I accept that. I'm going to come to God. And when you come to Him, then He gives you access to the power and the revelation and the understanding and the strength. Do you think, do you think anyone, I don't care how good, goody tissue, southern bell you think you are. Do, do you think any one of you would truly repent had the Holy Spirit not given you the power to repent? Do you think any one of you would have turned away from the sin in your life had the Holy Spirit not come upon you and, and, and given you that strength and given you that revelation and given you that power? Come on, somebody. Amen. You think for one moment, you ain't, you, you that think you're living so right and so righteous, it's only by the grace of God why I love to say when I see someone and listen I'm not justifying there's some people who are living in sin and they justify it and they they're they're they're, they're trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus I would not want to be in their shoes yeah, yeah. but on the other hand the Lord spoke to me a couple days ago gave me a, a word that was so powerful it kind of shifted something inside of me he said when a person walks right up to the door of temptation I mean they you know they probably made a bunch of errors getting there and they are on fire with that temptation anybody here don't raise your hand anybody here know what I'm talking about <laughs> all right you are I want to do this thing I'm there I mean it's screaming at you and it could be I don't know whatever it is whether it's lust whether it's drugs whether it's drinking, whether it's anger, or, you know, bitterness, or rage, or violence, or whatever it is. Come on, somebody, amen. amen. And you all, and you've walked up there, and if you come to me and say, well, I've never been there, I say, you, you, you lie. That's why I think these preachers that walk around and try to put on the air like they have arrived. Yeah, I've been behind the scenes with them, trust me. They arrive as long as they're up there under the anointing and then walk off the platform. Yeah, their old man arrives back. <laughs> Come on, man. And you ride up there, and, and yet you're at that moment, and everything in you is screaming, do this. 
and you say no. When you make that decision, no, I'm not going this path. God spoke to me. He said, at that moment, all of heaven rejoices. And I was like, what? Heaven rejoices, but they made 20 mistakes getting there. Yes, but at the moment when they were faced with crossing that final line, it was the love of God that caused them to make a decision. And everything in them is screaming, do this. And they say, I will not. Heaven says, yes. Come on, how many of you have ever watched that movie where that person was going down the wrong path and you're screaming at the screen, no, no, no. And in the last second, they turn and do the right thing. And you're like, yes. Come on, amen. You're, 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 you're bo- okay, they shouldn't have got there. But praise God, when it came down to it, they turned back and said, no, I'm going to live for God. Heaven rejoices, says hallelujah, they overcame. Let me tell you something what the devil will do. When you say yes and overcome, then the devil will spend the next three weeks beating you up, beating you up over all the mistakes you made to get there. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. And don't keep running up that door because you might not keep saying yes. Or you might say yes one time. You might turn, not say no to it. But let me tell you something. He'll beat you up and beat you up. And you just got to sit back and say, well, wait a minute. You know what, devil? You almost got me. You, all, you almost pulled an eve on me, but you didn't get me. You almost got me, but I'm not going that path. I love the Lord. I have value. I have worth. The world is not even worthy of me. See, when you begin to come into the revelation of that concept, you begin to come into the revelation of the value and worth that God has put on you, it is so much easier than to say no to sin. I'm not going to. I ain't going there. Come on, amen. on when that young lady who was raised in an abused household finally gets the revelation that she's valuable then she's going to stop going out with all those dirt bags who beat her come on amen i'm better than this i don't need to put up with that treatment i have i have more value my lord okay someone say he loves me say it again say he loves me are y'all getting something tonight is this right Mm, I'm, maybe I'm just talking to myself. All right. They subdue kingdoms, work righteousness, obtain promises. Hmm. They grabbed a hold. The word obtain, literally, it means to grab a hold of. They obtained promises. <laughs> when you have the confidence of your worth, hmm. <clears throat> Minister I know had a problem with American Airlines. He said, I need you to change this for me and not charge me these ridiculous fees. Oh, sir, that's the policy now. He said, I want you to look up my record. For three years straight, I was your number one passenger. I flew more miles than anybody in your entire company. Three years straight. And they looked up the record. And he said, I want to talk to the top supervisor that's here. And they came out, looked up the record. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. So-and-so. Yes, sir. Yes, we'll take care of this for you. We'll let it See, he was confident. I'm such a valuable customer. He ain't going to treat me like the, you know, the infrequent flyer. <laughs> You're going to give me some extra perks. Because I have greater value. Come on, come, y'all hearing me? That's just a little concept. When you understand your value, you can walk in with that boldness and that confidence. And you can get there. And you walk in that confidence with God and say, the promises of God legally, rightfully belong to me. The world, are, world, the world is not worthy of me. And God, God said, I am valuable enough to receive the best. Yeah. 
I was over in England uh, when I first started traveling. I was over in England, and I was staying in the cheapest of the cheap hotels, you know. And in England, that's pretty scary. I mean, in London, I mean, I mean that's the red light district, okay? And, uh, and, I mean, it was so cheap that we had rooms but not bathrooms. It was only one bathroom the whole, uh, the whole floor, you know, and you had these rooms. And, you know, I mean, it's always scary when the floor is moving and it's not, and it's, you know, <laughs> and the bed has, you know, got extra bumps in it that move along, you know, Roach Motel. I mean, you know, you know, and, and there's, you know, screaming and yelling and hollering and all kinds of out things in the street at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, and I'm staying in these places, and, and the food is terrible, and you can't get food late at night and all this other stuff. And I had some preachers come to me, and they sit there, and they said, hey, Steve, wh- wh- what are you doing? I said, well, I'm sitting there, why are you staying in those horrible places? I said, I can't afford anything else. And they turned to me, and they said, did God call you here to England? I said, yes, sir. He said, are you getting rest? I said, no. Are you, getting, are you getting proper nutrition? I said, no. How are you doing towards the end of the trip? I said, I'm wore out. Because I had done this several times. I'm wore out. He said, did God send you here to minister? Or did God send you here to go the poverty route? And I said, well, God sent me here to minister. That if you're going to minister most effectively to these people, you're going to have to be rested and you're going to have to be able to eat properly. I said, so you need to stay in a better place. And I said, I can't afford it. They said, if God sent you, God can pay for it. Come on, amen. amen. But I'm sitting there thinking a little bit too much still with a poverty mindset. Am I talking to anybody here? Come from a poor family with a poor man's mindset and thinking, oh, I got to scrape and I got to hold together. I got to scrape. I got to hold together. I got to save every little penny. So I finally decided, well, I'm going to, by faith, I'm going to step out. I'm going to stay in a little better place. And that's a lot more money there in London. It's, everything's expensive. I mean, you could stay in a Hilton with a little tiny bed. Their beds are like this big, you know. They're a little tiny. You know what I'm talking about. little tiny bed. You could stay in a Hilton-level hotel, and it's 350 400 bucks a night. And I'm in a tiny room. I'm in a tiny. My bathroom is way bigger than these rooms, okay? I'm in a tiny room. But I sat there and I took the step of faith. I stayed in nicer places, places that had rooms or room service or hotel or restaurants open late so I could get food late after a service and these kind of things. And I got all the way to the end of the trip and suddenly I realized uh, the money of the offerings that came in increased enough to cover the extra expenses. And I said, Lord... How'd that happen? And he spoke to me and he said, Son, you will set the level at which you live. He said, You want to believe me to barely get by? I'll supply barely getting by. You want to believe me for something better? I'll supply that. Come on, amen. Are, are y'all with me on this? He spoke to a friend of mine who was sitting there going, uh, he was he's spending $700 a month renting a, uh, uh, an apartment or a, or a home, and this is 20 years ago. And they were believing God. They wanted to step into a, him and his brother and, and rent a more expensive place. And it was about $1,200 a month. But he was really stressing on the money of it and the money of it. And the Lord spoke to him and said, hey, I said I'll supply all your needs. If your needs are 700 bucks a month, I'll supply it. If it's 70000 a month, I'll supply it. It makes no difference to me. But part of the process that's kept us from moving into our increase and moving us forward and living a life of faith is we sit there and we don't think we're worthy of that. I'm not worth. Now, I'm not talking about bathing yourself in the lap of luxury, but you are worthy of the best. He's making a mansion for you in heaven. He's going to adorn you with a crown of jewels like the world has never seen. He's going to give you a robe finer than anything ever on the earth. You have incredible value to God. Somebody say, I got value. Say it again, I got value. They obtained promises. How? They confidently walked in and said, that rightfully belongs to me. Now listen to me. I'm going to smack the devil right here. This is where people go wrong in the body of Christ. They think because they have need, then God is obligated to give to them. God is not moved by your need. That's why you see he's moved by faith. He's moved by people that are loyal and confident and boldly come before him and receive it. And that's why you see some people, it seems like all they get is blessing on top of blessing on top of blessing. And other people who love God, don't get me wrong, they love God, but they're always in lack, always without. 
Why? Because there's something inside that often speaks to them. Well, I'm not, I don't, I'm, I don't, I, I'm not worthy. I'm not valuable. And then you know, you know, you have a bit of that. You know, you have that mindset when you begin to resent when people get blessed. Do you think Bill Gates ever resents anybody else making a billion dollars? Never thinks about it. But boy, there's whole segments want to stir you up. Oh, that billion dollars, how, how, how horrible. That, that, that business made a billion dollars. Oh, yeah. They're evil, evil. Dun, 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 you know. <laughs> stir you up. And then, hey, that should be yours. That should be yours. That should be yours. Because you got this, you got this mindset. You don't really realize that you are valuable enough to, by faith, attain the promises to get everything that you need and enough abundance on top of that to be a blessing to people around you. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right. I don't know. Y'all get, all right. Stopped the mouth of lions. Ooh, I got to get, okay. Lord, help me. All right. Stop the mouth of lions. Uh, let's go to Judges chapter 14, verse 6. Uh, Judges 14, verse 6, and then we're going to go to 1 Samuel 17, 34. Judges 14. Oh, Ramos Sunday. I got I to gotta find. I, oh, I got, by the way, uh, Judges 14, that's my first note. Judges, Judges, Judges. Where's Judges? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Judges. Judges 14, verse 6. You got that up there? Let's Help me out here. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have tore apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. The Bible says the devil roars around, like, uh, he goes around, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. By the way, I always have a picture of that. It said like a roaring lion, didn't say it really is one. He's a toothless lion. He wants to come and gum you to death. <laughs> but he said when you walk in faith, that confidence that devil comes up and threatens you. That spirit comes up. Robert, if you'll help me out. That demon comes up and threatens you. That past th thing comes up and begins to threaten you. You're going to fall. You're going to go back. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. It's, don't raise your hand. Come on. If we could be honest, those of us who were in some junk, our past junk talks to us once in a while. Am I talking to anybody? Come on, our past junk talks to us. That's why I always beg young people, don't get into the junk because, you know, they don't have any so many voices screaming at you in 20 years. But when you walk in faith and that confidence, I have value, I'm a king's kid. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm a joint heir with Christ Jesus. You turn to that little slew foot devil and you say, excuse me? take you down it's amazing when you recognize the strength you have in him somebody say strength ah, that's one several ones down I got to get to but when you're weak then you become strong somebody say his strength it's amazing when you become strong how things change. I was down in Orlando at, a con at the conference and snuck away with Josiah. He came down with me and snuck away to Disney. Now, this is not a good testimony. We snuck away with Disney and, and uh, there's two lines. We're ready to go in the parking lot. There's two lines going in. And I'm and they're going this way and I'm in this line. They've got the two cars in front of me. The guy's just sitting there and the attendant is waving them, come and turn, merge in and turn. And, and I guess they were like panicked, you know, like, oh! And he's waving, 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 and all the people are going by parking, and I'm going, I'm going to park, you know, we want to, I want to get in. It was just about to open, and I, I like to get in there right as it opens, so, you know, got to go ride Buzz Lightyear before anybody else does, you know. 
So, so I toot my horn. I'm two cars behind him. Beep, beep. Beep. Beep, beep, beep. The guy's not moving. So then the attendant starts pointing back to the next car and says, you know, you move over because this guy's like frozen. He ain't moving. You move over. So that guy starts to move over. Well, I'm, he, he needs to actually back up a little bit. So I move over. Well, this guy gets an attitude with me. I move over. And just what he instructed me to do, he sees me move over. He runs out and stands in front of my car. And then lets the whole other line. And he's blocking the entire line here, letting all, having the, all these people go. And I was like, well, what is he doing? So I tried to get around him this way. I mean, that's what he did, like this. And I was like, what? And I went, beep, beep. And he looked at me, and I tried to go this way. And he went. <laughs> and I wrote down what I said, hey, what are you doing? You told me to move over here. Now you're getting an attitude with me. You know, you're blocking me. And he's, and he's like, you know, he's sitting there. And so I, I keep trying to get around him. He's doing he, this little, you know, little back and forth. <laughs> Now, I've been working out a lot for the last three years. And I've gotten pretty strong. Stronger than I've ever been in my life. And for a brief moment, and it was a, uh, trust me, it was a moment. The thought went through my mind, I could take you out. And then I had a picture of me getting out in my mind and a big old sign saying pastor upper room church <laughs> ah, that probably wouldn't be good but when you have the understanding that you're strong it gives you a confidence come on amen when you got the understanding that you're strong in the spirit that you are strong in the Lord, even if you don't feel you're strong, because you have access to great strength, and greater is He that is in you than He that's in the world. And you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And no one and no thing can snatch you out of His hands. He's holding you. When you know that He's holding on to you, you're not holding on to Him. Come on, y'all hear me? Then you have the confidence and the strength to turn to that devil and say, Hey! Hey, back off, bud. I'm not listening to you. I'm not going to be tormented by you. And you better start running because I'm coming after you. Come on. Come on, say, I can overcome. Come on, say, I can overcome. By faith. Oh, let your hands and talk to him in the Holy Ghost. 